Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Hilliard Guess, and you guys are sitting here at your homes or in your offices or wherever, enjoying our amazing event we're about to have. I'm Hilliard Guess. I'm the co-chair of the Education Committee, which is the one putting on this event right now, um, along with uh, my co-chair, Jeff Melvoin, and our vice chair, Anna Davis. Um, our mission statement is the Writers Education Committee has a broad mandate to develop programs that provide WJ members with practical inside knowledge about how the industry works and how it is changing, emphasizing tips and tools to help writers succeed. The goal is working knowledge for writers. So with that, you guys are gonna enjoy this one. Got my man here uh, in the building, Daniel Zucker. He's the one who brought up this meeting to us, this new event, whatever, and it's gonna be awesome. You guys are gonna enjoy it. Take it away, Daniel. Thank you again, Rada. We love you guys. Have a great one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hilliard, and thank you, Writers Education Committee. Uh, my name is Daniel Zucker. Um, our new uh, panel is, uh, is called From Writer to Writer Director. Um, it's a series of interviews, right? Um, here's the introduction, uh, because it's our first one. Uh, directing. It's a dream for many of us. I've met a lot of writers over the years that are interested in directing and in directing their own work in particular, but that's a hard transition to make. Um, those opportunities are rare and it can be hard to know how to get there. I think that me uh, mentorship and good practical advice from people that have done it uh, is often difficult to find. Um, so I've partnered with the Writers Education Committee to create this interview series with well-established members of the Guild um, that have made that transition to directing. We're gonna talk about that experience, um, how they made the jump, what that first opportunity was like, and how directing has impacted their writing and vice versa. Hopefully along the way, we'll impart some wisdom that will help the next writer make that meaningful leap. Um, our first guest we are so lucky to have is Rada Blank, uh, film director, performer, writer, and proud native New Yorker. She's the winner of the 2020 Sundance Vanguard Award. Her first feature, The 40-Year-Old Version, was one of the most acclaimed debuts of the year, for which she was awarded the Sundance Film Festival's U.S. Dramatic Directing Award, Gotham Awards Best Screenplay, NAACP Image Award for Best Writing in a Motion Picture, New York Film Critics Circle's Best First Film, Los Angeles Film Critics Association's New Generation Award, and the National Board of Review's Spotlight Award, among others. She was also named one of Variety's 10 Directors to Watch and called a brilliant filmmaker by the New York Times. The film's debut at the Paris Theater made Rada the first black woman director to be showcased there in its 75 year history. When not writing for the stage and screen, Rada performs as Rodimus Prime, whose brand of hip hop comedy has sold out shows from New York to Norway. Rada, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, first thank you of all, for inviting me. I loved this movie. And uh, I thought that its subject, you know, given its subject matter, it was so fitting to have you open this series. You know, this story about a creative person and her burning desire to make her dreams come true. Um, mm. I thought that it was so, it, it, it was it was timely. Um, I think a lot of us know that feeling when a dream feels far away. Um, and I, I think we can all really relate to your character crying and eating ribs and saying, I just want to be an artist. Mm. Uh, I've, I've been there. So, yeah. so let's talk about the genesis of the project, um, which is simultaneously so personal and also so universal, I think, to the creative experience. Can you tell us about the feelings that, that motivated you to write this story? Uh, rejection. Rejection and adversity are the things that seem to water my, so my soil as a creative. Um, you know, I, I, like a lot of people probably in this chat, I've hit a lot of walls at times and I found very much like my character, um, you know, 
uh, relief and comfort in kind of taking back my own narrative and taking it out of the hands of people that I've kind of given my power away to. And so, you know, the film is very autobiographical. I mean, I was just hitting a lot of walls as a performer, as an artist, and I had just gotten fired off of my first uh, screenwriting job. And it was the job that put me in the guild, actually, as a writer. It was my first official screenwriting job. And I gotten fired and I was devastated because what I didn't know at the time as a novice professional writer, I've been writing my entire life, but this is like the beginning of my professional career is that you're gonna get fired, you're gonna get let go. Um, at the time, I didn't know that that was something that, you know, that I now kind of look back on fondly, but I just, uh, I just felt the need to, you know, be the person making the decisions in my creative life. I figured if I created a project that I would write, direct, produce, and star in, I couldn't get fired. And so the 40 year version initially was um, a web series. You know, um, if folks like Issa Rae and, and um, you know, other artists, you know, our examples of is like, you know, DIY, cultivate an audience yourself. You have a platform like YouTube and like anything is possible. And so that was the plan as I was going to write and direct 10 short webisodes. And at the end, you could um, download a mixtape, you know, with songs that connected to the plot and the narrative of the web series. Wow. And so I had written all of these songs mainly as this kind of novelty companion piece to go with the, um, the web series. And we were gearing up to shoot the first two episodes as, as a crowd, you know, funding tool uh, to pay for the back eight. Right. And uh, right before that happened, my mother passed away. And it, um, it really changed my life. We have the same birthday, you know, like we were best friends and it, it kind of just blew up my world. And so for a time, I just, not only did I, kind of pushed the project aside. I just didn't want to create art in the same way. You know, this was my biggest champion and she wasn't here to cheer me on. Right. Um, so what I did was I just started going out and performing as Rodimus Prime. It was like the catharsis I needed, very much like my character. I always say the movie is like an origin story. And so I went out and performed as Rodimus Prime for about two years. And then when I came back and looked at the web series, it just felt for this type of story I wanted to tell, it just felt too small at that point. And it felt like I had maybe aged out of telling stories uh, um, in a web format. I just wanted to go bigger with it. And so right. then I was like, how can I, you know, really set this apart from other things. I said, well, I could shoot it on film and I could make it black and white. And that began the journey of me trying to find producers and um, funding for the film. I was fortunate enough to get in the Sundance um, Screenwriters Lab, which, you know, for someone who didn't go to school for film, um, or rather I should say, I didn't go to film school. I did go to school for film, but I didn't get past the 16 millimeter class because, you know, you, when you're doing like a liberal arts degree and the uh, specification is in communication, film and video, you have to take a bunch of courses across the medium. And, you know, you take your two 16 millimeter classes and then you move on. I didn't want to. Like, there was just something about cutting the film on a film bed that I, I wanted to stay in that place. Right. So, because I didn't follow the rules, I ended up not really being a film major. I was just kind of jumping all over the place. Um, but I kind of lost my thought there. What was I saying? I was talking about. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh 
Yeah, you wanted it to stand out, so you shot it on film and black and shot white. Shot it on film, shot it on black and, and white. Oh, oh, what I was saying is that I I haven't had a whole lot of training around writing. The 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 writing I got was you know at one point I studied under Fred Hudson at the Frederick Douglass Creative Arts Center, which is more like a community arts you know uh, workshop. Sure. Sure. Um, but outside of that, you know, film and TV were my teachers and theater were my teachers. And so to get into the Sundance lab meant I would have like a real concentration and mentorship and fellowship around my vision as a filmmaker. So, you know, that really made a big difference. It meant there was a trajectory for my vision. Sundance was getting behind it. And that drew in potential financiers and, and producers. Uh, fantastic. Um... Tell us uh, about the team. I, I was struck by what you said about, um, well, a lot of what you said, but but something that I, I was interested in was tell us about the team you assembled around you. So so here you are, and you have this this um, you figured out what story you want to tell, and you you found you know what place you are at um, in your career and in your life to be able to tell it. Um, who are you know? I'm interested in to to know like. Um, the support structure in the early days mm -hmm. of development you built. So like, who was the first person that really shared your vision and believed in this story and said, okay, Rado, let's get this done. That would be Lena, Lena Wade, who okay. I was friends with for years before she became my producer. And she had been, she had uh, over the years tried in her own way to like support me or you know, offer herself up as a producer. I think I was really gun shy. I just was nervous about working with a friend um, in that capacity. But once I came through the Sundance channels, um, actually the first, actually it was Octavia Spencer. What am I talking about? She was my, one of my uh, mentors, advisors at, Sundance and wow. I remember we did a reading and um you know somebody told me it was the first time in the Sundance labs where like in a long time that a, a, a screenplay a screenplay reading got like a standing ovation or whatever and I remember her just saying to me like what is happening with this when is this happening when it, and it was the first time someone like had that look in their eye where they saw you. You know, like I'd gotten great notes from my advisors. My friends are always supportive. I have a wonderful fellowship with other black filmmakers, but this was someone who I, who I did not know personally, but who seemed to have the investment of a really close friend. And she just kept asking me like, what's happening? When we get off this mountain, what's happening? And so she, initially started trying to connect the dots in terms of financing. And then I went through a series of potential producers. I mean, it's like dating, to be honest with you. It's yeah. like, you meet someone who's really nice, but is it a fit? Do y'all have the same vision? And, you know, along the way, some very well-intentioned um, producers just saw the film differently. And I don't think that they were trying to discourage me. I just think that they were trying to, you know, find some, find a real foundation around the film. So they'd say, well, do you have to shoot it on film? Can you shoot it digitally? Can you shoot it in color and then transfer it, you know, make it black and white? And the whole way, you know, is it, do you, should this be the title and should you be in the role? And so, Octavia was the first person to, to look at me, almost, almost became a mirror in that, like, because she was so excited about it, you know, and this isn't Sundance, because Sundance, you know, of course they see you having a trajectory, they're really there to help you cultivate the project. This was, this person was talking about doing something with the project. Right. So it, it started with Octavia, and then it was Lena, you know, after going through a, a series of, of, potential producers. Um, Lena was the first person. I remember we were at Sundance. We, you know, we met as TV writers 
seven years ago. And I'd always end up coming back to New York because I'm not really an LA person, nothing against you guys, but I'm not an LA person. But we would meet up at Sundance and we would go to movies together. Sure. And I think it was in 2019, we met up at Eccles. We'd seen something that was a little sketchy. Um, and I remember her turning over, her, her looking at me and was like, are you gonna let me help you make your movie or what? And that was it. And that was it. Sundance 2019, by April of that year, I had someone commit to financing, probably, you know, fully commit to financing, probably because she was like, let me help you make the movie. She attached herself to the film. And then that was it from there. It just, it just, it took off, you know? Wow. Let me ask you a question. Uh, as you were going through, you know, this, this round of dating, you know, as, as you call it, where, you know, um, did you, I mean, I, I've I've run into this and I've I, I know a lot of writers who have as they're trying to put a movie together. Did you ever get any pushback? Like when you said, hi, I wrote this and I'm gonna direct it. Like did did people try to, you know, be like, okay, this is cool, but like what do you think about attaching so and so and going in like a different direction? Yeah, you know, I think that that is a natural reaction. I, I would say to any writer who is transitioning into becoming a director like don't let people's um, concerns throw you off mm -hmm. you know it's their intention to like have a surefire um production you know to make sure that that all the eyes are dotted and the t's across sorry it's late um so but yeah i did get pushback you know, like I said, around the title, I, one time, you know, someone jokingly suggested Tina, Tiffany Haddish as the lead, but they were, they were joking, but they weren't really joking. Um, right. You know, listen, they, there's just like a high risk factor. Nobody knows who the fuck I am, you know, as a writer or a director. I mean, some people in New York knew me as a playwright, but this is my first film. I'm shooting on black and white film and I'm going to be in it. I mean, I remember one potential producer slash financier was like, I love your script and I, I love you as a person, but you know, we we just worked with someone who wrote, directed, and starred in their own film and it was arduous. And so, you know, your producers, you talked about who I surrounded myself with, your producers are kind of new. And I'm not talking about my executive producers, I'm talking about my on the ground producers. Right. Some of them are relatively new at this and we really would want you to work with ex you know producers and i had met with those people and they weren't really a fit uh, as far as i was concerned and so whoever would come on board to um executive produce this and go out and get me the money they had to believe in this project from top to bottom and and lena pretty much her gift three gifts she gave me was that she trusted me with my own vision she got me the money, um, even put in some of her own, we were falling short. And then she got out of my way. And that as a combination in a executive producer financier, it's a, it's a gift. Sure. Um, but I think that she knew that for this film to work, she had to let me be me and do me. And uh, I remember I was working with one producer and a potential producer. And um, they said something to the effect of like, well, I don't know, Rod, it sounds like you want a lot of control, you know, kind of like a Woody Allen or Spike Lee. And I was like, yeah, exactly. It's your life, you know? it's your story. Like, It's my life, it's my story, it's my story. first film. You don't get yeah. another first yeah. film. Sure. And so, you know, it, it it also, you know, also I'm thinking about the New York canon, right? Like yeah. Cassavetes, Sidney Lumet, you know, mm -hmm. Spike, mm -hmm. you know, that other filmmaker I mentioned earlier, you know, like they've made great New York films. I still feel like there's an angle in the frame that the camera needed to p 
pivot a little to the left so it could capture just a, a, another part of New York that yeah. I haven't seen. Sure. I haven't seen me in, in a lot of these movies. I love these movies. You know, Dog Day Afternoon is like one of my favorite films. I don't see myself in it. And I also, I have to say this about the universal journey. I'm not a big fan of that concept because what it says to me is for you to get a film, you have to see yourself in it. Mm. I actually don't believe that because I've seen a lot of films that had nothing to do with my own personal journey that were just good fucking films. And so I actually think what speaks to maybe a greater hope for humanity is that you can see something that you're not in and still arrive at it with some kind of respect and openness for something that is different and not similar. So I only say that because this idea of writing universally has become like, it's the catchphrase of writing. Sure. sure. And then people say, well, if you write specifically, you write universally. That's actually not true. You know, like, I love it when people say they see themselves in my journey. But they didn't have my mother as a mother. They didn't have my particular experience. Right. And I think you can, you can do both things at the same time. You can watch something and see yourself in it. And you can also watch something and appreciate it and not be a story and still, you know, um, I just say all that because I get that. Sure. A lot of the films that informed me, my voice as a storyteller, there's nothing about me that connects to the characters or the protagonists of the stories. They're just good stories. And so I wanted to add something in the New York canon that, you know, yeah, people see themselves in, but also it's just like, oh, this is another voice in this big city of New York that maybe we think we know, but we haven't really seen or heard of, so. Sure, I, um, sorry. No doubt, I, I love the talking heads, those just these little vignettes that you find on the street of, you know, this is the person going to the bodega, this is someone coming mm -hmm. out of, you know, the, you know, the doctor's office, wherever, and like, uh, you know, going to back to something you said about like, okay, here's the camera, let's turn it a little over here, who's that guy? across the street and like what's what's that woman's point of view um and i love that you know uh something something i really liked about the film is you know your character is going through uh her personal experience but then other people get to weigh in too because they're nosy you know like everyone's that's gonna new york yeah that exactly. is new york you know like it's part of why like i've tried to live other places but especially as a storyteller, like the honesty here, the authenticity feeds me. Yeah. And you know, um, a friend of mine uh, who's a cinematographer was in like one of the early feedback sessions for the script, for the, for the film. And uh, it was when the film was whew, two hours and 30 minutes. Um, and he was like, you know, for a director's cut, you did a great job. I, I really love what I'm seeing. I wish there were more landmarks, you know, more mm -hmm. visual um, landmarks of the city. And then I went back at my B-roll and I just started trying to look, and he said more cutaways and stuff. And then I just started realizing like, oh, wait a minute. First of all, that of the filmmaker, the opening of his black and white film you can't top that with Gershwin playing and, and fireworks and, and the city just twinkling. I was like, there's no way anyone yeah. can, yeah. can, can re can capture that. And we shouldn't even try. It helped me to realize that the people are the landmarks, all those people chiming in. Those are the New York fixtures I wanted to focus on I because, love that. you know, again especially people who look like me sound like me um just in terms of the new york story it, it did not center this much so it's like okay it's not a cutaway of 
the, the Empire States, but, but we have this amazing uh, vendor, you know, who runs the beauty shop and he's a, he's an institution, you know what I mean? Totally. So, yeah. Uh, I love that. Um, uh, okay. So, so now we're in pre-production. Okay. Um, when you're really beginning to do the job of director, can you walk us through those early days, things you did to prepare um, hiring or interviewing crew, you know, making the d early decisions that would shape your movie. I know you mentioned sure. uh, like, uh, you know, from the jump, you're like, okay, this is 35 and this is black and white, like some mm -hmm. of the greatest, you know, New York movies ever. But, um, you know, what, tell us about, um, yeah, like, uh, you know, as you start to like pull it together and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and find your collaborators beyond just the producers? So I've been preparing to make this movie for a long time, in my head at least, even before I called myself a director. And so mm -hmm. there were different people who I knew I wanted to connect with. Because it was my first film, I think maybe what a smart person would do is surround themselves with you know, tried and true vets. I did not do that. I worked with people who may have not had the experience, but there was an investment and passion. A lot of my department heads were native New Yorkers. And so they were like, oh, we get to tell our New York story. And so that was kind of what I was looking for above all else was just that passion to tell the, tell the story authentically. Um, a lot of the people were friends. Gary Day, my music supervisor, had not been a music supervisor before, but there was nobody else for the job um, because he, he had such a profound respect for the process and the film, but he also just, I had a voice. I was a, I was a, a co-creator with every single department. I had my hand in everything. I mean, it's, so, it's such a personal film, so that, shouldn't be a surprise, but, you know, um, my DP, um, Eric Bronco, you know, he hadn't worked in 35 millimeter black and white film before. Um, but when we met with each other, he, he brought like a hundred pounds of black and white photography books to our first meeting all the way from LA. Like he flew them in and he was like, look at this and look at the, you know, so again, like my collaborators, some of them were new to their actual position, but they were very clear about what it is that they wanted to do. And I was like, someone took a chance on me um, as a first timer. And so I had no problem doing that. And then I just peppered more experienced people, you know, in between some of us newbies. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of those meetings, when I think about them, like, and some of the people, again, like Peter Kim, who plays my best friend in the film, he had that role from when it was a web series, you know? So some of it was a no brainer, um, but I, I had a hand in everything. Um, I don't know that I would make or need to make a movie in the same way because I, won't likely be returning to myself as the subject or the source material, but because I shot in my old apartment and because it took place on my block and my brother is playing my brother and that's my dad's music and my mother's artwork, I had to be involved at almost every level. And so I found people who were hungry, but also open and um, generous, you know, with the space around the ideas um yeah fantastic um going back to the music uh, you you mentioned your music supervisor so I'm, I'm interested to know like you know because this is it's one thing to to make a you know uh, uh a, a character drama or something for your first movie you made arguably you know you made a musical so so i'm curious like of, about the musical angle um you know was your music supervisor was that uh or is, was that the person that was crafting, you know, producing the beats and like putting these tracks together? Um, no, or like I had people the... like Crisis, um, um, Beat Miners from Brooklyn, 
Um, but Guy Rute was the bridge to those things. And, and the way it would work is we go to a studio and, you know, I come from uh, hip hop, you know, and so you go in the studio and he would just, I wouldn't say a hundred, but it was a lot of beats. And if my impulse was to freestyle to it, then that was something that we would stick a pin in. And it just so happened that a lot of the people that we listened to, and sometimes it was blind, I didn't want to know who it was, just let me hear the music. It just so happened that someone like Crisis, who did the beat for Poverty Porn, yeah. he produced Sean Price, one of my favorite rappers from Brooklyn, uh, R.I.P. You know what I mean? And so the, the connection to the music was just like intrinsic. Like we treated it like we were putting together an album. And um, if I had the impulse to freestyle, if I started rhyming, then that was the song. And then where everything else was concerned, it's like, you know, I was raised by a jazz musician. I just think when you think of New York and you think of black and white film, you think of jazz. And so those were the two art, the two um, genres that was kind of cradling the film, jazz and hip hop. And the, the Quincy Jones song that plays at the end, which is one of my favorite songs ever, was just a song that I was with my friend Tash Mosley. We were driving through LA and it came on, I think it's WKRP in LA. This song came on and I consider myself a child of jazz music. And so I think I know, or, and this song came on, I was like, what is this? This was years ago, of course. And he's like, it's Quincy Jones, you know? And it just blew me away. And I immediately started seeing images. And I think this is before I went to Sundance. I just immediately started seeing images. So at some point in the process of, whether it was the web series turning into the screenplay, some of the music was already baked into the script, you know? Um, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, did you, uh, we, we've talked about some other, you know, some other films that have inspired you over the years. You know, uh, was there, you know, were there, like, do, did you and your DP, for example, like put together a watch list? Like, were there specific mm -hmm. films that inspired the look or the feel of this um, that, that, sure. that spoke to you? Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, a, a filmmaker who really influenced me is John Cassavetes. Mm -hmm. um, he's not known for his comedic films, but just, he just, one lesson I learned from him was to trust the actor. And, you know, he, he had to trust the actor because he would get in like, so close you could see their pores. And I'm like, wow, I want to have that kind of exchange. I want to be that person on camera, but I also want to encourage that kind of vulnerability and availability. So he definitely influenced me. Um, Hollywood Shuffle, you know, another film about a black artist um, going up against white gatekeepers, you know, so I felt like my film was talking to that. Um, the work of Kathleen Collins. She has a film called Losing Ground, which is one of my favorite films ever. I discovered it later um, when her daughter re-released the film about six, seven years ago. What I loved about that film was, you know, it's the first time I saw a Black woman character like that who was not, you know, typically strong, and supportive of, of, of all the other characters. She was really contemplating her life and the quality of her life and what she wanted. And I just don't see um, black, that many black women characters in film having that introspective journey. You know, am I happy? And am, am I doing enough? Do I love what I'm doing? And so I was really encouraged by those films. And, you know, people, when they talk to me about the film, they assume that there's one particular film by one Black filmmaker that's also in Black and white that influenced me. And I think that that filmmaker influenced a whole generation, but 
I often want people, you know, when I showed the film at um, the Paris, I was also invited to curate the films that influenced me. Wow. And, you know, I just challenge people to look deeper. Don't make assumptions because I'm also black. I'm from New York and I'm shooting in black and white. That that is my, that person is my only influence when, hmm. like I said, John Cassavetes, Sidney Lumet, Christopher Guest, um, Andrea Arnold, uh, Robert Townsend, Kathleen Collins, Hal Ashby, you know, like I have many influences, you know, and it, I'm, I'm always moved when people can see them in the, in the film, but also like at some point you have to step away from the influences and create your own path and your own vision. And so I don't think this is a bad way to start a career as a director. You know, I know that the, 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 the dialogue, the title of the dialogue is like from writer to writer director and just in full transparency, I feel like I was always a director. I just didn't know it. And I was maybe too afraid. And when people ask me, well, where'd you get your training? I was, I feel like I was directing film even as a school teacher, as an arts teacher, because it was the first time I had to work with, you know, a dynamic of, you know, the, all these different personalities in that setting over the 20 years, it wasn't a professional setting. And so I'm meeting people where they are and still had the task of encouraging them to, you know, meet the script um, while also, you know, um, creating their own interpretation. One of the things I'm most proud of is casting Oswin Benjamin as my love interest in the film, mm -hmm. never acted before this movie, never. Wow. And Fantastic. I know a lot of people look at him and say, oh, he's just playing a version of himself. Not true, that's not who he is at all. Oswin, I love you Oswin, but he's a goofball. He's an absolute goofball and a cut up. And the fact that he was able to play this thing so straight, what it reminds me of is, remember when Gabare Sidibe kind of blew everybody away with her performance in Precious? Yeah. And people were like, oh, they found this girl off well, the streets of Harlem. But then she started making the rounds on the, uh, the late night talk show circuit. And like Gabby, like she talks like this and like she, she loves Justin Timberlake and all this stuff. And people were like, oh shit, this woman was really acting. That's how I feel about Oswin. And he's someone that I stalked online for a couple of weeks. Like I, I, there was one particular rapper that I wanted to play the role um, I can say it now, Joey Badass. And he was not available to us. And so I, I literally went to Google and I put in New York rappers because because all the people that I know and love were not working or not coming to mind. Right. And I saw a video with Chris Rivers, that's Big Pun's son, and this rapper named Oswin Benjamin. I was like, who's this guy? And like for the next couple of hours, I just went down. And the minute he walked into audition, he was the person. He said to me, he said, I feel like I've known you. And I said, I didn't want to tell him I was stalking him. He was like, yeah, I feel like I know you too. And <laughs> I remember sitting there with Jessica Daniels, my amazing casting director. Um, she's a native New Yorker. And he auditioned and we were trying so hard to not like explode because we knew, I knew. Yeah. And I remember, I remember Jessica being like, are you trying to take my job from me? You found this guy online. And what he was, he was, amazing and I couldn't call him soon enough you know there was another actor who was going to be reading for us and I had to respect the rules of course but if I had my way before he left I'd have been like you got the part and so yeah like I'm just proud of how we made this movie in that enough people trusted my vision like you know I remember the first shooting the first day at um, there's the canopy. It's the scene where I'm going to Archie to tell him I want to be a rapper and I look like the Unabomber and everything. And but that was the very first scene that we shot. And I remember the tension that I felt in my body because it was that moment where 
some people I knew, some people were new high, you know, people I didn't know, but we all were like, everyone has that look in their eye like, okay, is this gonna work? And that first, that, those scenes are all like wonders, you know, there's no cutting away. And this is yeah. the first scene we're shooting for the movie. Yeah. And I have Peter who's like theater actor so he can handle it. But I was like, what? you know, I remember being in the scene, acting with him and, and looking at him and being like, I'm saying my lines, but I'm like, you might, this might have been a mistake because this is going to be too much. And so we shot those two winners a number of times. And then you could feel this collective, like everyone was like unclenched their butt cheeks because they were like, oh, okay, Whew. she's not terrible. Peter's great. There's a banter here. Sure. I think we're going to be all right. Like people were kind of looking around like, okay, I think we're going to be all right. Um, but that was an exhilarating feeling for me because even though it was my first film, my work as a teaching artist, my work as a stand-up comic, as a playwright, as a rapper, as a sometimes performer was preparing me for that moment. So that even though I didn't go to film school, I was like, this is that, what I'm That was your doing. film school. Yeah, that was sure. my film school. And I have to say that too, for people who might be intimidated about getting into film school, about, you know, oh, I'm doing this too late. Here's the thing I realized is that no amount of film school can prepare you for the snags that are going to happen on set. You know, I did have an experience at Sundance where, you know, it's this beautiful, <laughs> tranquil uh, mountain resort with a babbling brook. And I'm shooting a scene that's supposed to be Brownsville, Brooklyn. You know, and we ended up, I worked with um, Rob Wilson, my, my wonderful editor who I met at Sundance. We ended up editing this movie together. Um, we ended up creating a soundscape and stuff, but it was hard to find locations on this resort that might even feel like, you know, a New York interior or whatever. And I remember I had found a really great location to shoot one of my four scenes. And the day before we were gonna shoot, the location fell through. And I feel like moments like this where the filmmaker was born, I think normal New York Libra Rada would be like, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. I was just like, okay, what, what else can we do? And this second location, we started going there, we started preparing and making it work. And I really just said, this is what we have to do. I know I, I wanted this location, but this is what we have to do. And don't you know that the first location became available again? So I almost felt like that was that test. And there was another moment like that on the set where, you know, this is a 20, 20 day shoot, we have one pickup. So it's 21 days all together and we're, we're nearing the end. And on this particular day, this might be the day before the, the day before the last. And I was tired. It's the scene where I am, I go to him after my play and I'm wearing the tux and we're eating the chips and all this stuff. I was tired and I probably wasn't as pleasant as I would have liked to have been. Found out that my the one of the permits didn't come through and I had to change my shot and stuff and my my spirit was like slowly sinking and it was doing that in front of everybody because right I'm not hiding behind the camera I'm in front of the camera and the minute I say the minute we go action I have to now act and I'm trying to do this and it's just falling apart I cried all the way from Brownsville Brooklyn back up here to Harlem in the back of a cab and I was just like you know that feeling when you're like a nine, 10 year old kid and it's like first day of school, you're trying to make friends, but then you fall in front of everybody and you're just like, mommy, I'm not going back. I was doing it. That's exactly how I felt. I was like, I can't go back. My assistant Ashton was like, oh, you only have a few days left. We got it. I was like, I just can't. I like, but the next day I woke up and I went back. And that's when I was like, I think I'm ready to be a filmmaker because in what felt like, and I'm looking back, it probably wasn't, but what felt like my greatest failure on set. Hmm. I was able to live through it and go back. And so I was like, 
even after that embarrassing moment, like I'm going back, I must really want this film shit. You know what I mean? So that's not something you're going to learn sure. in an academic program. What you can get an academic program is those resources. So you get to experiment and then you get to build fellowship. But I am prime example. Like if you watch enough films, read enough books and watch enough stuff to kind of decide what you what kind of movies you want to tell, you can make film. <laughs> you don't need academia for it. Um, that's amazing. You know, that that scene is I actually thought I that was one of my favorite parts in the film is you you know you arrive in this you know it's it's the it's the you know it's sort of you kind of turn the climax on its head like you show up and you're in this beautiful clothes and he's a, and you and you tell uh, Oswin's character uh, I just came from my premiere and he looks at you like well what are you doing, what are you doing like, here like, right. are you shouldn't you be at like the after party or whatever and you just I love this moment where your character just looks at him and you're like I don't know I'm here like I'm right. I'm following I'm following my heart in this moment which is so much of what I think you know you've been doing that whole time um I loved it mm-hmm. um thank you um so let's uh, so where Rada's Rada the character arrives at is FYOV, right? Fund your own vision, find your own voice. Um, I would say, you know, imagine you're in a dialogue with a young filmmaker on the precipice of making her first feature. Um, what what is some practical advice that you might share or impart from from doing this? Um, or some or or another way of coming at that is. What's something you wish someone had told you uh, before day one of shooting when you show up looking like the Unabomber? Okay. Um, This is going to sound so simple. Drink lots of water. Because even if I wasn't in my movie, the adrenaline, the highs and the lows, you know, like the stress and anxiety you you're holding that in your body and you just need to be well rested and if you're not well rested physically at least find a way to to get well rested mentally because what's going to happen is you're going to get on set and something is either going to go wrong or you know at one point our light kit was not there and you, you always have to be in service of the film, you know? And so along with drinking water and getting rest, make sure you, you get out of your own way, you know? If you're in that space where you're maybe meditating on, you know, like I've learned to not get too attached to a certain outcome. You still have to drive the film. When other people, your biggest allies on set are like, well, why are you doing it? You still have to drive the film. So it's it's this it's this dance between holding on to your vision, but being open to what shows up as well. So you you the film, it lives first it's on the script, right? right. Then you get in rehearsal and now it's in the actors' mouths. Now you're adding equipment, you know, your shot list, and now it's on set and we're looking through a lens. Like it has many iterations. You just have to learn, I think, to be malleable. You know, like one of the things I had to do was tell my screenwriter to sit down because otherwise I would be, I would, I'm going to rewrite every scene, writers especially. It's never done. I could always tweak this and I could always do that. I had to at one point tell that part of myself, like, thank you. You did your part. We're going to, there's no improvising on the set. There's no improvising in the film. Um, There might be a little between me and Peter because it was, you know, it's the most lived in relationship. Sure. Where we should be finishing each other's sentences. So we would do a little bit of improvising before the scene started. You know, like this is the conversation 
two yeah. minutes before the camera peers in. Um, but really just trust your vision, you know, like that moment where everyone was kind of look at me as I was kind of flailing, you know, I think I might've lost sight of my vision in that moment. And I was so busy looking at people looking at me. You, you have to be a little, a little nutty, you know, in that nobody's going to see it the way you do, you know, and, um, excuse me, even if your own doubts start to say, wait a minute, I thought you wanted to, you just have to hold tight, you know, just get very clear. This is what I wanted and I'm going to just carry it through. You know, it is, I mean, I can say that now because I'm on the other side of it, sure. but there's only one way to get to the other side and that's to go through it. And so I, I give advice from time to time. But I also sometimes say fuck advice, you know, because that person is not sitting in your body and in your moment. Right. And when young people or new filmmakers, because a new filmmaker could be 75 years old, sure. when, when new filmmakers ask me to mentor them, I always say to them, you know what? I don't think I'm available, but I know, I think I know somebody in your town. Which, which street you, oh, you live on 57th Street? Oh my God, 57th between what and what? Between what? Six and seven? I know someone who lives on that block. What's your building? 321, 57th Street? You're not going to believe it. I know someone who lives in that building who could right. be a great mentor to you. And I eventually get to the fact that they are the mentor. You know, like nobody knows better than you what it is you want and need. So we're so busy looking outside of ourselves, you know, like, I've met people who I have worshipped as artists and I meet them and they're not so kind, you know, or their breath stinks or whatever. Like, you know, like ultimately at the end of the day, you're holding on to that vision. You know, like uh, every once in a while I run to people who maybe weren't used to someone looking like me being in charge. I always, I always said to myself, that's their problem. That ain't me. They ain't got nothing to do with me. Especially when people would say, well, I'm just trying to help you. No, boo, I hired you, remember? <laughs> yeah. Again, what I realized though is those are their self-doubts talking. Mm -hmm. And they're projecting their self-doubts on me. And understandably, you know, like, we don't know if this is going to work out. Um... I'm glad that it did. I'm glad people liked the movie. You know, now I feel like I have less, less fighting and convincing to do to maybe make something else. But I, I drink water, get rest, meditate, be clear in your vision, trust your vision, and then fellowship, have fellowship. Not necessarily, I'm not talking about be friends or, or, or turn all your friends into crew, but just have fellowship. At one point, when we found out, we realized how long it would take to process the black and white film. If I'm going to shoot on black and white, it means I'm not going to actually see my dailies for four days, which is my producers. Right. One of my producers is like, see, if you just shot on color, you get it back in two, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So what did I do? I called Karen Stance, who's a good friend of mine. And I said, Terrence, what would you do, blah, blah, blah. And Terrence was pretty much just like, I'll barely look at dailies. So that's my answer. So then the solution was like, well, we're going to get a VTR so that I can see the aesthetic, the setup of the shot. I don't quite see the quality of the film yet. I'm going to have to wait four days to do that. But it was calling on one of my filmmaking brothers that helped me again. They put a mirror up and reminded me what it is I wanted to do. And so it was scary telling, pushing back at my producer, that one particular producer and be like, no, this, is, this was my vision and I'm not changing it. And then I had Lena on my side. So Lena was like, no, nope, this is what she's gonna do and you're gonna sure. let her do it. And so water, meditation, breathing, um, centering oneself, knowing, you know, have, five, 10 films that speak to the type of filmmaking you want to do and then have fellowship. 
you know, the people who can, you know, when your spine starts to get a little rubbery, they can kind of lift you up again and remind you what it is that you set out to do. I love that. I love that. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You know, you, you, you can enter a process with a whole list of heroes in your head, like the people that you name. And, mm-hmm. and maybe in pre-production, you know, you, you're referring to their work or you're just kind of inspired by it. But like when it's 10 o'clock at night and you're on the street and you got to get the shot, it's you. And like you're trusting yourself. And, and I, you know, I, I'm really moved by that that sort of self-actualized like um, instinct that, that you speak to where it's like you, it's trust, you know, uh-huh. and there you are. I love that. Um, so, uh, so here you've, you've made, you've made the first one and it's, and it's great. I, I wonder to circle back to the beginning of our conversation when we talked about the feelings that inspired you to do this in the first place, do those mm-hmm. feelings uh, still exist for you? Um, do, do, have they changed through, through this process? And, and maybe do you see them in a new way? Um, I always wanted to tell a story. I've done it since I was a kid, in many different um, formats. I do feel that if I'm being completely transparent, filmmaking is my passion is my story, is, you know, telling story is my passion. A lot of the things that come with it are not, you know, like having to sell a film, having to, you know, be the mouthpiece of a project, you know, like, I guess, it, you know, you have to, I guess it's part of the job. I did not know that. I was not aware that I'd be spending so much time talking about the movie. And so I think in going t- into whatever I do next, I'm just going to get clear about like what my focus is and making sure that the focus always stays on the making and not the talking and the selling, you know, that I'm, I'm going to find, I want to continue to make films. I want to be an auteur and I want to continue to make films independently. Mm-hmm. And so I have to, you know, maybe so that I don't spend so much time selling the film, I have to now take the time in um, cultivating, you know, my resources and my financial streams for the next work, because I, I want every film to feel like a first film, meaning, you know, I'm not doing stunt casting, I don't have like major cameos, I'm, I don't have like a $10 $10 million CGI budget, you know, like I want them all to feel uh, like you can touch them and that they're accessible and that when you watch a film, you're just completely immersed in the film and you're not going, oh God, his last film was amazing. Oh, you know, he won the Academy Award for the book. You know, like you just get taken over by the film. And so I am smarter. Um, I am, I am smarter, but I could work even more smarter because of the amount of energy that I used in, you know, like I said, it was 21 day shoot. I loved my editing process. And then once, once the film was sold, there was this other hat I had to put on that I was not aware of. And so I'm excited to make something new when I do it. I will definitely just be more aware of how I use my energy. Mm. Thank you so much for talking Mm -hmm. to me. I learned a lot. Um, Those are my questions for you. Uh, I'm going to see if we have any in the Q&A, if if we have a a couple minutes, um, if that's cool. Okay, let's see what we have. Um, uh, Tara, just wanted to say thank you uh, for, for making this film. Um, she says, as a 41-year-old writer, working at Breaking In, getting your insight and hearing about this experience with this project from its original genesis through its completion has been uh, aspirational. So uh, Awesome. Um, fantastic. 
Um, just to, to say to the audience, we, uh, we have a couple minutes here. If uh, you'd like to submit to the Q&A, now would be the time to do that. Um, so we will see what they say. Um, uh, another thing I want to offer really quickly, especially since we're, you know, the idea is to encourage people to, you know, transition from writing to directing is like the workshop, you know, like as often as you can, even if you don't have um, financing, you don't know what your budget is, like script is still in flux, gather people together to read your work because it is your first snapshot of your set. You know, you're in a room, you're watching, people are picking up your script, they're embodying the characters that you, you may have um, created yourself and it is your first, you know. So do that as often as you can, even as a playwright. I don't really know what it is that I have until it's read. So where some people might write 10 drafts, I get a reading of the first draft. You know, and how the actors are responding, if they're struggling to say, say certain words or, you know, just how they vibe. Off the, it's very telling if my intentions are coming across, like I'm getting to hear it for the first time. So, yeah, I just wanted to encourage people like, again, you don't have to go to film school, but there are things you can do to at least start your your process so that you're not like jumping from one role right into the next. You know, you have had some experience working with actors and, ha and hearing them uh, say your work out loud, out loud and then maybe even spatially, you know, what to do with their bodies and stuff like that. Um, you, you don't need money to do that. You just need some people willing to read your script and the space to read your script aloud. Fantastic. Uh, okay, we have a couple of questions here. One is, um, uh, how long was the process from, from green light through post-production? And, and, uh, uh, and if it's something you're allowed to disclose, what was the budget? Sure. So my process, the green light was April 13th. I'll never forget it. Uh, 2019. And... We shot August 4th, 2019, 20 days. I went, Rob Wilson, my editor, who's amazing. While we were on set shooting, he was pulling together like, you know, the dailies. And I remember the day that he got, you know, you had to, I had to wait those four days to see what my actual footage would look like. I remember when he, he texts me, I'm on set and I'm about to do a scene. And he's like, wait till you see this footage. It's so beautiful. So that just gave me more like, so August, all of August we shoot, took maybe a week off. And then I went back into the editing suite with Rob to work from, we didn't have much time. We had maybe two or three months now, Here's something I have to say to you. I, it's always been my dream to present my first film at Sundance. And the year before, I thought we were going to go, you know, that the film was going to move forward. And so the Sundance became like the, the, the thing that I was kind of basing everything on. Well, I have to shoot by here if I'm going to submit to Sundance. Da, 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 da. Right. For some reason, I was able to let that go in, 20, in 2019 and hand in my director's cut to Sundance, I think that was like right before Christmas. So that was like two, three months to get a rough cut and then deliver a DCP at like the beginning of January. So that's kind of the process. And sure. then we went to Sundance 2020. Um, I won directors, but what nobody knew was that Netflix had kind of already put their bid in, you know, before we won that award. So hmm. it wasn't like, oh, she won the award. We should buy this film. They, you know, um, they, they are were very, very they passionate. Are 
Yeah. yeah, we were having clandestine meetings at like 3 a.m. And they were like, we love this movie. What's up? So yeah, I hope that answers Great. the question. Um, oh, and the budget. My right. budget was around $4 million at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, next question. How was making the transition from TV to film? Um, were, uh, uh, were you doing it simultaneously or... Uh, because you had said that you had begun as a, a TV writer. Well, I actually began as a playwright. Okay. And my plays became my writing samples for TV writing. And the last TV writing job that I had was, and she's got to have it with Spike Lee. Yeah. So 2018 was my last time working on uh, a TV show. And I was living off of my savings up until we shot the movie in uh, 2019. So, um, but yeah, you know, I have to be honest with you. I thought that as a TV writer, I'd get more on the job training as a filmmaker because, you know, when you write a script, generally in TV, you get to produce it and you're on set. That wasn't the case for any of the shows I worked on. I right. just, you know, they had, uh on set writer um or some of the filmmakers some of the the, the creators you know I, I worked for spike lee baz lerman and lee daniels or towards in their own right who pretty much you know what i mean they already had their snapshot of what they wanted and yeah. so i didn't have a lot of on set you know experience in the tv world um right. but it just made me hungrier to, to make my own work, um, yeah. Uh, that that uh, is a good transition to the next one, which which has to do with shadowing. So, mm -hmm. um, so this person is asking your thoughts on shadowing, um, and uh, you know, had you done it um, on set before you uh, directed your first film? It sounds like you hadn't, but um, what are no. your, you know, what are your thoughts about shadowing? Is great on? if you can if you can do it, do it because I think it will take, you know, I'm a big um, believer in demystifying the process, you know, so that you don't get too intimidated by all the blips and the blops and the whatever it is you're looking right. at when you're on set. If you can shadow, do it. I mean, I was a PA <laughs> in my younger years, so it's not like I've never been on a set. I've yeah. been in a couple of independent films. So I have had the experience. I just, there wasn't any immediate experience or anything I could point to and say, you know, but if you can shadow, do it. Absolutely. Um, great. Uh, next question. What are you, what are you planning to do next? And would you ever direct a film that you didn't also write? Uh, which is interesting because you see yourself as an auteur. Um, does, does that auteur, you know, uh, um, um, label mean that you have to write as well as direct and be in it? Uh, does that have a shifting, you know, like uh, definition? You know what? I'm figuring it out in this moment because uh, I've had some really great friends in the industry who you know, now that the film is out and they are confident that I could handle myself on set and maybe yeah. not make a piece of junk, they're reaching out to me and saying, hey, I had this series, I think you should direct an episode. And one, I am prioritizing for the first time my own storytelling. So it's not likely that I would do a lot of directing for hire. Um, especially if it is pulling me away from the stories that I want to tell. Cause I've, you know, I've waited this long to tell them. Right. But I'm also finding that when people send me stuff as director for hire, it's great stuff. But my inner writer, my inner writer is like, I, yeah. Nah, I would do this and I would do that. And I'm just like, oh, I don't know if they want me on this set because I'm already rearranging things and blah, blah, blah. So I'm hoping to, 
I'm not really talking about what I'm doing next. I've just always been that person, you know, like I'm praying that if there's ever an announcement about anything I'm doing, it's already done. You know, I don't like talking about, but um, what I do next will be, will come from here. And, um, you know, I, I'm grateful that after all these years of being a hired gun that I can, I, I can do that now. So that's what I'm doing. Great. Um, someone asked, they were hoping to hear what you meant when you said, meet people where they are and encourage them to meet the script. Um, uh, can, can, you, can you speak to that idea a little, a little clearer or, or more? Well, I guess when I say meet people where they are is, you know, what is their skill set, you know? And I mean, this also is about encouraging like hiring people who may not have the most experience. Um, I think it's a balance. If someone who gets your vision, like when I say meet the script, like they get, they get your vision um, and they can help you execute the vision, um, but also like based on their own set of skills and talents, you know, like, I always compare it to dating because you have an ideal in your head of what a great partner would be. And then you meet someone that makes you go, hmm. you know, that hmm, is what I'm talking about. It's like, leave yourself open because someone may not be as decorated, but they're talking about your, the world you created in a, in a way that you weren't even speaking on it I remember working with Baz who by the way nobody says no like Baz he's a master you know like you pitch something to him he'll never say the word no out of his mouth he'll go yes but or yes and you know and I've learned that you know like you know like there's a way to there's a way to to softly let somebody down. Um, but he always talked about, you know, when he was making Romeo and Juliet, there just so happened to be a young 19 year old painter in the room, like literally painting the walls, who happened to be a Shakespearean scholar. And so they're talking about what they want to do, da, 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 and the guy was like, can I just interject? And that ended up being his creative partner for years wow. this guy who is simply painting you know the walls there so you never know where you know that lift is going to come from you just have to be open sure. you know? there's one question here about something that we haven't covered yet which was uh which concerns your process for you as a performer because in this film you're not only directing but you're also directing yourself uh, and and acting in it, or or uh, you know, presenting yourself in it. Um, what 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 was that process like? What challenges came up? You know, uh, as you're you know, what I would imagine is you you're switching hats, you know, constantly. Um, can you can you speak a little bit to to uh, to that and and any you know advice you would give for people who are considering doing that? Um. My first question to a person who's considering it is like, why? Why are you in your own film? Right. I was in my own film because I'm playing myself and I wanted to tell this, this very specific story connected to the loss of my mother, which there are some differences between me and my character. I never won a 30 under 30. By the time the film starts, it's, it's a year into the loss. My mom has been gone since 2013. Um, so my first question is like, why do you want to tell the story? And if you're very clear about that, go for it. Um, one of my um, uh, advisors at um, Sundance, why is his name escaping me? This is terrible. He was on The Wire. He directed episodes of The Wire. He directed episodes of Homicide, Life on the Street. 
Why am I forgetting this person's name? Oh, this is terrible. Anyway, yeah. he he was amazing. And one of the things he told me was when you're in a scene with an actor, once the scene starts, the director is gone. He said, because otherwise, you know, you'll say your line and then they'll say their line and you're like looking at them like a director. And I just wanted to be a generous scene partner. Mm. I wanted to listen, you know, and because I'm not trained as an actor, one of the great things that Octavia Spencer uh, encouraged me to do was like always, you know, if you need to write down just what is happening in this scene for you as an actor, just so you, so you are aware how to color the scene, use it as your legend because you're going to be jumping around, jumping around. And so it's like, if there's one word or two things I need to remember to, to hold on to when I do the scene, you know, I wanted to match the energy and, and um, of my scene partner. You have someone like um, Peter, who is a story theater actor. He's been in movies, Margin Call, Sex and the City, you name it, and a lot of theater. And then you have Oswin, who has performed mainly on stage. And so like, it was about finding a balance between those two energies, but definitely the minute the camera starts rolling, I would give myself over to my scene partner. And I learned after a while, I had this remote monitor. I started using it less and less because I'm shooting the scene or setting up the scene and I wanna go look at what it looks like. I gotta step away from my scene partner and look at this thing. And I found that that would change the energy. So I would do it at the beginning so I was just very clear. I had a stand in my own cousin. Tracy was my stand in. Look at the scene. And I mean, it was like theater, yeah. you know, because again, there's four minutes on a mag of, of film. And right. so we didn't have digital where it's like, well, let's do another, let's do another. So that urgency kind of fed all of us. Like, this is like live performance. And even in terms of the shooting style, like, I wanted it to feel like a documentary. That's why there's a lot of swinging and a lot of handheld because mm -hmm. I wanted the camera to feel like a person kind of peering in over the over the you know uh, shoulder of a person to see. So it's it's it, you know the frame might shake a little bit or might be a little fuzzy here and there. I just wanted to feel as raw as possible, and so I wasn't going for like Oscar winning performance. I just wanted it to be honest. That was it. I love that. Uh, last two questions. Uh, Morgan asks, um, what's something that can help writers um, get actors interested in a project? Another question, another way to think of that is, you know, maybe specifically for you, you know, when you approached um, uh, an actor or, or some talent um, and, and, uh, and met with them, spoke to them. Um, what's, what's, uh, you know, how, how did, uh, how did that process go for you? That's a great question. Um, I think I said, I mentioned Jessica Daniels as my casting director and she started to become a great, you know, grounding of the casting work. Some of the people I stalked, Imani Wilson, Crazy Lane. She was in my friend, um, Rashad Ernesto Green's film, Premature. I saw at a screening, I went right up to afterwards. I was like, yo, I want you in my movie. Um, Oswin, I stalked online, Peter already knew. And then um, uh, Jessica helped to fill out, you know, um, Jacob Ming, Ming Trent played the homeless guy across the street. She filled out and found all those other wonderful people. I think at that point for me, you know, with Lena attached, you know, Sundance, uh, you know, script, Sundance Lab, those things help to pull people in. But, you know, I think that we're in a day and age now where we have to be really savvy about how we tell our stories. Maybe you shoot a one minute sizzle, you know, just something that you could put online that is like a visual poem. It just sounds really fucking corny, but like, just something that can whet the appetite of 
a potential, you know, actor, or whatever. And the other thing, and this is what I meant to say about Aswin is, it, I mean, you have to be a very confident storyteller to do this, but I always tell my actors, like, we are building this together. So you get an opportunity to fill in the blanks where where Aswin is concerned, you know, we both knew that part of what bonded us in the film was that we had this loss of the mother, but I never decided how his mother died. I let him create all of that. And so I'm not the type of person who, and this again, Casavides is one of my greatest teachers, like my, my actors are my co-authors. And so that's a way that I would engage actors is being like, look, we're gonna create this together. You get to create, you know, the backstory for this person. You know, I I don't know how to play the tuba. You're the tuba player. I know I've composed this music, but you have to breathe air and life into it. So that is something I said to actors. And I think someone like Peter, who was there from the very beginning, he really did get to shape the life of that character. So that might be a way you create a sizzle, create the appetite, but you know, let the characters in and let them co-author. I don't mean the script; I mean the life underneath it. Right. You know? Right. Um, thank you. Uh, last question. I'm I'm going to combine a couple here. Um, it has to do with the the with uh, financing, with putting it together. Um, can you speak to a little more to the process of of securing financing for this um um you know uh i'm just to summarize the last one it's um you know we we're in a a crowded marketplace and you're you know you're telling an authentic story about um you know you um is this cassavetti's way of of filmmaking you know the only way to 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 uh, to break through and and find money to make it, I guess, if if that makes sense. You know, I think that Camille Billups, God rest her soul, her and her husband um, James Hatch had the Hatch Billups collection, and they were this. They were the loving couple from that movie, you know, Black woman, white man, and they've been together for decades as a couple, and they also created together. When I finally, um, you know, she's very bohemian. She passed away, but she was very bohemian with charcoal and, you know, Indian earrings and blah, 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 blah. And I remember one time I had won uh, uh, New York Foundation for the Arts grant. It's like a $7,000 grant, which was a big deal to me in my 20s. And, and Camille Billups, you know, was going to speak on filmmaking because she she had this archive and she did all these really interesting films. And when we're like, what, what do we need? What do we need? What do we need? We're all thinking she's going to say, you need the spirit and the drive. And she was like, you need money. <laughs> like at the end of the day, you need the resources, you know, you want to call it Bitcoin or whatever, you need money. And I know that that is a, a, a scary thing for a lot of filmmakers because we're living in the worlds that we create in our minds. But I don't think it hurts to start thinking about that, especially once you finish your script. You know, like, I'm going to get to the, the financing thing. I'm just talking about ways you can prepare yourself before you have these meetings with people. It's like, the amount of locations that show up in the script. You know, like there are a lot, like people look at my film and they think, oh, maybe 2 million, but look at how many cast members are in that film. It had to be populated like that for it to feel like a New York film. And so it costs more than people think it does, but, but everything that I needed showed up and that's why it cost what it did. But, if I got to a point where I'm like, hmm, maybe I don't need this, maybe that, that's just you thinking in that frame of like, how can I really achieve this? And do I need a, 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 a 50 foot robot jumping over, you know, 
um, St. Nicholas Park? Do I need those things? I, you know, I'm not encouraging people to, to limit their vision. I'm just saying, just be prepared. Like how bad do you want to make the film? And can you cut back on the 342 locations so that your budget is smaller and maybe a little less intimidating? The other thing is, I think because I had a web series and I had shot a couple of music videos and you know, written a couple of plays, my voice was present in different ways. So financiers could see like, okay, she hasn't shot a film yet, but she's done this and she's done that. And that. I see the disparate, these, diff these different pieces and I could see how it would come together in this one person. So create a footprint of work. It doesn't have to be film. It could be shorts, it could be blah, blah, blah. But you wanna give somebody a taste of your voice so that they know who they're getting in bed with. And then, apply for grants you know even if it's a developmental grant where it's like five thousand dollars to go away and write the script you know what that is telling the financier is that somebody has invested in the development whether it's rooftop films they have opportunities there are all of these different uh residencies retreats you know sundance which i applied a lot of times and didn't get in um, but in the meantime, I was applying to NIFA and Creative Capital, stuff like that, like start smaller, you know, find those allies to invest in you on a smaller level. It looks good to financiers that other people have made even small um, things. And then, you know, like find, find those producers now. Because if they've made a film or two, they may already have a um, Rolodex of potential financiers. Um, you'll have someone to kind of um, help you kick the can down the road with you, you know, to alleviate some of, some of the stress you may have around who's seeing the film and all the other stuff. But like, it is a multi-prong attack. It's not just, you know, don't think it's just one financier is going to come along and blah, 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 before. I got the financing, um, which was ultimately through one of me and Lena's agents. They found it. I got into the creative, I mean, I got into um, Catalyst, which is a pitching forum for filmmakers. Right. Right. And what's great about that is, did I raise money for the film there? No. But I think if I went back, all the people who were like, mm, I don't know, black and white film, you're, we don't know who you are. Your presentation was great. Those people wanted to get behind my film. They didn't, but they, they didn't do it, but they wanted to. So again, even if I'm facing rejection there, I'm creating, I'm still planting seeds of potential financiers for the next round. You know, so like, like I said, multi-pronged attack, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket, get savvy. Create a, create a paper trail of your voice in little places here and there. Get smaller grants, which to the financiers, it's like, oh, somebody's investing in $5,000, $10,000, but it's something. And yeah, apply, apply, apply to any and everything. You know? Radha, thank you so much for your time and your participation and your wisdom. This has been so wonderful. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. And I, you know, I just want to, again, um, just encourage people. I made my first film deep into my 40s. I look, I'm older than I look. I'm moisturized. Um, I think if anything, would it with my making this film? So it, it's all very possible. It's all very, very possible, you know? So I'm, I'm wishing everyone Godspeed and good luck, you know, because we need, we just, I think when writers become directors, you have people who are invested in story from another point of view. So we're not just about, clearly we're not just about an aesthetic, but because we're writers, we want to earn the aesthetic. So like, yeah. we need more of that storytelling out there. So I'm hoping everybody who's listening <laughs> makes their film. 
Thank you, guys. Uh, and thank you, everyone who, uh, who joined us tonight. This has been dream come true. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Daniel. Bye.